Good morning, everyone. I am Narayani Perla from Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. And I will be talking about an important topic, which is how does the prognostic outlook for patients with double head lymphoma impact disease management? So before jumping into the topic per se, I would like to give a quick primer on what are double head lymphoma cases. Patients harboring translocations of MYC, BCL2, and or BCL6 genes are labeled as double head lymphoma cases. In the event of translocations involving all the three genes, that is MYC, BCL2, and BCL6, we call them as triple head lymphoma cases. Most of the double head lymphoma cases are GCB subtype with MYC and BCL2 rearrangement being uh, the most common. In the minority, when ABC or non-GCB subtype has a double head, it's usually MYC and BCL6 rearranged. Although in the older WHO classification, the double head and triple head lymphomas were classified under one umbrella as high-grade B-cell lymphomas with MYC and or BCL2 or BCL6 rearrangement in the most recent WHO iteration, the double head lymphomas are still categorized uh, pretty much in the same umbrella. However, the triple head lymphomas are now classified under rare B-cell lymphomas. For the purpose of this talk, I would combine both double head and triple head cases. Okay, jumping right into the topic, What's the special thing about double head lymphomas, right? So the most important salient features in my mind about double head lymphomas is that there is increased or a higher predilection for extra nodal involvement compared to non-double head lymphomas. And the sine qua non or the most important feature of double head lymphomas is the refractiness to the frontline treatment. In other words, the standard of care treatment, which is our shop, the outcomes are very poor to the tune of five to 24 months overall survival. There is no widely accepted frontline treatment for double head lymphoma patients. However, those adjusted R epoch has been commonly used in this setting. Where does the data come from for double head lymphomas and those adjusted R epoch? In the pivotal study done by Dr. Dunleavy and his colleagues, they showed that patients who received, uh, in, in that study, they included MIC rearranged DLBCL cases and I included uh, a pretty good number of double head lymphomas and triple head lymphomas. They showed that the patients who received those adjusted R epoch, the outcomes were very good. And in particular, double head and triple head lymphoma patients had overall survival uh, over 80%. Hence, this has been very commonly adopted in the treatment setting in the, in, um, in the, in the clinical practices. Has there been a head-to-head -head data comparing dose adjusted R epoch and R chop? Because the data from Dr. Dunleavy was mainly a single arm study. The only available data that compared dose adjusted R epoch to R chop in a randomized fashion, which was a CALGB50303, there was no difference noted in the progression-free survival or overall survival. However, it is important to note that there were only 13 MIC rearranged cases. And among these 13 cases, there were only three confirmed double head lymphoma cases. And then the rest of the 10 MIC rearranged cases, um, the partner gene was not known. So, Given this extremely limited sample size, it's really hard to uh, decipher anything of major importance and, and, and to show that dose adjusted R epoch is superior to R shock. So we can't answer that question. So the next question that uh, comes into uh, uh, to my mind or to the physicians is, do we have anything better than dose adjusted R epoch for these patients? Before I go there, I just want to give a quick um, primer on lenalidomide, right? So lenalidomide 
is an oral immunomodulatory drug, as we all know, that has direct anti-tumor and indirect uh, effects on tumor microenvironment. Lenalidomide in preclinical studies has shown to downregulate MYC and its target genes by affecting the cereplon and IRF4 uh, mediated pathways in the lymphoid cells, thereby making it as an attractive therapeutic option for MYC rearranged large B cell lymphomas. So I'll be talking about two of the studies that used a combinatorial approach wherein LEN was combined with chemotherapy backbone. The first of the two studies is R squared CHOP, wherein lenalidomide was combined with R CHOP. In this study, which is a phase two uh, uh, conducted by the Hormon group, lenalidomide was administered at 15 milligrams for 10 days, combined with R CHOP at standard dosing. In the studies, the investigators showed that the outcomes were pretty promising with both uh, event-free survival and overall survival uh, almost approaching 70%. But most important, but more importantly, when you put together the two studies, which is the R squared shop by the Hoven Group and the dose suggested R epoch by Dr. Dunleavy and his colleagues. Again, we're not trying to do the cross trial comparison, but if you want to put those two studies together, the efficacy data seemed comparable. However, the toxicity data was favoring or towards R squared CHOP, wherein the patients had lesser infectious complications and less treatment related mortality, thereby the, the tolerability was favoring more towards the R squared CHOP. And again, the caveat being you cannot do cross trial comparisons, but just on a snapshot, the safety seemed more comparable. So definitely this is an option in these patients, but we need more data to, to make this as a standoff care. The second of the two studies that used lenalidomide as the backbone uh, with chemo uh, chemotherapy was um, lenalidomide combined with dose-adjusted REPOC. This was a phase one study uh, that, that showed that the combination was uh, tolerable. The, there were only five patients uh, that had double hit in this uh, small phase one study. But more importantly, what was noted is there was an increased risk for cytopenias, which is not unsurprising when you combine these two agents, uh, with grade three or higher, uh, with, with grade three or higher neutropenia being uh, almost approaching 90%. There is a phase two study that is currently ongoing looking at this combination. And hopefully in the future, we will more about this combination, whether it is uh, tolerable, safe, and if the efficacy is maintained. In this phase one study, although it's it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really hard to, to determine the efficacy from the phase one study, but uh, the preliminary efficacy showed promising uh, results with uh, overall survival almost, the two-year overall survival almost approaching 87%. What else do we have uh, beyond uh, LEN-based combination approaches? It is venetoclax combined with dose-adjusted REPOC. So when with dose-adjusted REPOC is another uh, uh, study that has been done. Again, this is also another phase one study that uh, included uh, uh, a pretty good number of double hit and triple hit patients. I would say there were 15 patients in this study. They, all, they also included MIC rearranged large piece of patients. In this study, the investigators showed that the, the, the efficacy was very promising with, again, overall survival uh, data approaching close to 90%. Again, the toxicity being uh, uh, not, as, uh, not unsurprisingly uh, with the grade three or higher uh, major toxicity being uh, cytopenias. The maximum tolerated dose with this combination was noted to be when when the clax at uh, 800 milligrams for 10 days. However, the recommended phase two dosing was 600 milligrams for five days in combination with the RE POC for, for tolerability purposes. There is an ongoing phase two study currently, and we will uh, stay tuned if the data pans out and if the safety profile also uh, continues to be tolerable. 
The last of the studies uh, to look at uh, options beyond those registered are epoch is uh, the CAR T cell therapy. In the pivotal Zuma 12 study, the, the patients who were high risk, again, how was high risk defined in the study? Patients who had IPI of three or higher or double A or triple A, who had positive PET scan after two cycles of standard anthracycline based chemotherapy. So, just to give you an example, if a patient had an IPI of three or higher, they were treated with R shop again as standard of care, and then they had a, a restaging PET. And if they were positive on the restaging PET based on double scoring, they would get into the study. Also, if the patient had double hit or triple hit lymphoma, they received dose adjusted RIPOC and then had a positive PET after two cycles, they would also get up. They would be eligible to get onto this study. Patients received standard uh, uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy with fludarabine and cytoxin, and then received one single infusion of maxicapillalism. A total of 40 patients enrolled in this study with 16 patients. So around 40% being double or triple hit lymphomas. The overall response rate in this study was noted to be around 89% with a complete response rate of around 78%. This is all comers, right? Both high IPI and double hit. But if you restrict the analysis only to the double hit or triple hit patients, the overall response rate was uh, almost uh, approaching 90% or higher. So definitely, uh, this seems uh, as a, a very promising uh, uh, avenue for, for double hit lymphoma patients. This led to the, to the uh, newly launched Zuma 23 study, wherein high-risk patients defined as IPI of four or five would receive one cycle of standard of care chemotherapy and then get randomized to either standard of care chemotherapy, whether it is RCHOP or REPOG based on uh, their IPI or uh, double hit or triple hit status, or receive axicel, uh, axi uh, axicel or CAR T cell therapy. At randomization, one of the stratification factors is double hit uh, or triple hit lymphoma. So again, this, this study is currently being launched and uh, hopefully this will really throw uh, uh, a light into whether CAR T needs to be the 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 way to go in the future for uh, for these high risk patients, including double hit and triple hit lymphomas. Why is it so important to try to improve upon the outcomes of these patients? The reason being, we have one shot uh, to achieve remission because there is data to show that patients who achieve complete remission, uh, complete response or complete remission to the frontline treatment uh, in double hit or triple hit lymphoma cases, they have very good long-term outcomes. On the contrary, if they do not achieve a complete remission, then regardless of whatever salvage options we, uh, we, we try to employ, including stem cell transplant, the, the outcomes are dismal. So in essence, I would like to uh, summarize that in the current day and age, those adjusted REPOC seems to be the commonly used uh, regimen for these double hit and triple hit lymphoma patients. However, the future looks bright because there are a lot of uh, additional agents that are being studied at this time. And none of these uh, studies that I just discussed are yet uh, uh, approved for these patients. Hope, but, but in the future, we may be able to uh, uh, utilize those agents for these patients. However, I would like to caution uh, that people are trying to stack up agents on our epoch. And so the worry or the, the important thing to note is to improve the efficacy, which is obviously what our goal is. However, to maintain or minimize toxicity, right? That's another important goal for these patients that we need to keep in mind while we are trying to design studies and, and learn, learn about what approaches could be helpful. 